I've been talking all day, so I just had a glass of water and my throat is feeling the day. So hi, everybody. Uh, Scott mentioned I, I usually start with a little bit of talk about a topic, and uh, I do have one tonight I want to talk about, and it's, it's all about worthiness and developing worthiness. Uh, it's just, and these are themes that seem to pop up with my client interactions during the course of the week, and sometimes that's an issue, so I kind of remind myself some of the maybe tools and tricks uh, about different topics, and so this is kind of a reminder for me as well tonight. But on, on just ways to develop worthiness, I think it's such an essential piece of recovery for both the partner and the addict with sex addiction, for sure. So just a couple uh, pointers about that. One is to really try to believe that you have an inherent value. I think so often our core beliefs are such that we feel we're unlovable or we're unsafe or we can't do anything right. Uh, we have a lot of really negative uh, core beliefs, uh, images that uh, we carry about ourselves that we've had for usually most of our lives. And so I think um, we have to really be, um, be aware of that and, and really try to change those actively because those can really interfere with ourselves and interfere with our relationships uh, if we have these um, beliefs that are quite negative. The other thing that, that is sometimes affected by that, that we often see abuse uh, in, in our clients and uh, sexual abuse. And when this occurs with uh, someone who's underage, they can also start to see their worth in terms of sexual terms. They can kind of be sexualized, we would say. So uh, sometimes people who have experienced abuse really see their value in terms of um, their sexual appeal, the what sexual um, uh, value they have and, and worthiness in those terms. I think it's really important to broaden it, of course, beyond that, um, as especially as it stems from, from wounding. And that, that unhealthy validation, finally, when we have it, creates uh, what we call false selves, meaning that we have this, these beliefs that we don't amount to much and that we're not very valuable. And so we have to create this external uh, shell, if you will, to, to sort of gain validation from the world, right? And so we may go to the gym and have a great body or drive the right car or have a trophy wife or a trophy husband and everything looks good on the outside and we're getting praise from the world, uh, but it doesn't connect because we don't feel that way inside. So there's this hollowness to some of that. It's really a rat race that kind of ends up nowhere. So, so believe in your inherent value. Really try to get in touch with that. We all have it. Um, it just sometimes is a matter of finding it if we've spent a lifetime trying to uh, lose it. Uh, number two, embrace challenges. I think this is a, a thing that sometimes a lot of addicts, and it's true with partners too, we feel that we're kind of incompetent, that we um, things don't work out for us, that we kind of mess up all the time. And these are old, old messages that were really imposed on us. So I think it's really important to look at recovery, uh, whatever fellowship, whatever program, as really overcoming a series of challenges. In fact, getting into recovery is, is a huge challenge. And, and it's not just one big one, it's a, it's a number of different ones. So I think um, every day in recovery is gonna pose challenges. You know, hopefully most of them small, maybe sometimes they're gonna be big, but I think it's, it's in doing this gradual process of overcoming each of these challenges that we really gain not only a sense of mastery and confidence in ourselves, but we gain a sense of worthiness. I think that's really critical to know that, hey, I can do this. You know, I, can, I can get over this, I can get through this feeling, I can really help somebody out in a crisis, I can you know, ask for help. You know, wh whatever, whatever it is that we're challenged with that day is to really um, follow through on it and to know really that we don't have things by ourselves. I think that's a huge issue in worthiness. If we don't feel worthy, we may not feel worthy about asking for help. I think one of the, the biggest things we can do is learn how to not only ask, but receive help. Okay, so that's the two, embrace challenges. Three, know the power of the word yet. And I think so often we get into recovery and we think, my God, I've got to you know, fix this and this and this, and that's got to get great. And my, our whole lives are kind of, uh, at least my life, I'll speak for myself. When I got in recovery, my life was just this mess of unfinished problems that I had avoided uh, for years and just they'd accumulated and they weren't going to get straightened out in one day or one month or one year, frankly. It was, a, it was an accumulation of stuff. And so I really, I needed help with that, but I also needed to take a kind of a day at a time. I had to break it down into bite-sized pieces and really know that um, I didn't have to do it all today. You know, it, it, some of it could be done tomorrow. I uh, had a, used to joke about having three worry slots and couldn't, do, couldn't worry about anything more than three topics and everything else went on the shelf. And when it fell off the shelf and hit me on the head, then I deal with it. But um, gradually stuff got done. But I think that, that ability to have patience, and we don't have patience, that's not a real 
core strength of addicts, patients. So I think we really need to learn how to live with that uncertainty, live with patients, live with that time in between, where that's so difficult for us sometimes. Um, but to really know that, that it takes time. The other thing too, on that, the idea of yet, I always like to remind myself and, and other addicts is that, you know, addiction is all about a yet. You know, one of the most powerful things that I think got me in a program a little earlier than I might have was somebody that I really trusted saying, you know, well, addiction is you're on an elevator going down and, you know, you, you know where it's going, right? You can get off on the 30th floor or the 20th floor or the lobby or the basement, or you could ride it all the way down as far as it goes. So it's up to you, wherever you want to get off. But we know where, we know the end of the story. And so I think it's really important to kind of understand that that's a yet too. You know, we have a lot of yets. I have a lot of yet in my, yets in my addiction, the things that didn't happen to me, thank God, that if I were to go out, I know uh, a lot of those would indeed happen. Um, don't feel threatened by the success of others. You know, when I woke up, I realized that uh, I was not alone in the world, you know, in, in my recovery, there was a lot of people out there, a lot of different kinds of people. And um, I started feeling kind of jealous about stuff, jealous of, um, of their recovery, jealous of their serenity, jealous of uh, all of the things they'd done. And just, I, it wasn't a good place. And, and I realized that, that recovery and life is not a zero sum game where, you know, winner takes all, right? There's, there's plenty of good stuff for everybody in, in recovery. And I think truly really not to compare myself in that way um, uh, to you know, see how I was different or less than or kind of fed all my old stuff, um, but to really identify, identify as best I could. And uh, I think that was a critical lesson for me that recovery is not a competition. You know, it's not a competition for day, a day count or for how bad it got or the kind of drugs we use, the kind of behaviors we did or whatever, you know, that we can get into in our addictive minds of, uh, gee, how bad mine was worse than yours kind of thing. Uh, it's not a competition and neither is recovery. And, and we can really sort of take it. We are unique individuals with our own gifts and strengths. And I think one of the beauty of recovery, when you see it, is that people kind of discover who they are. You know, their, their particular set, their constellation of talents and gifts and, and uh, what makes them beautiful as, as individuals. And that, that starts to emerge in recovery. So, so don't feel threatened by the success of others. Just Watch, watch yourself. And finally, um, this belief that I'm enough. You know, and that kind of goes with this sense of delving worthy as well. Just we are just enough as we are today with the skills we have, with the awareness we have. It's just fine. Do we want to be on a path to growth? Yes. You know, but, but do I need to lose another 20 pounds before I'm going to give myself permission to feel okay? No, you know, no I'm not. Do I have to have another degree or do I have to? Um, have a, a success in this time, or do I have to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or you know all that stuff that we kind of impose on ourselves, just to know that we are enough, just as we are today. So I think these are just kind of basics um, of developing worthiness, and it's a real challenge for us because uh, we often don't feel it's it's not certainly anything that was came naturally to me, and so it was something I had to learn, and it felt very unnatural at first. But um, we need it; it's an essential uh, attitude about. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, this reminds me of, um, well, uh, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time talking about, it, you know, either here in drop-in groups or other webinars or, or uh, in, in my Saturday work group about the underlying cause of addiction, which almost always boils down to shame. Um, we learn early on that we're just not good enough. We're not, we're, you know, and as sex addicts, we especially want that external validation um, because we have no in internal validation. And we're just never enough. We're not good enough. There's something wrong with us. Nobody could ever love us. Um, and, and worthiness is, is such a key part of recovery. Uh, you know, Brene Brown calls it shame resilience. It's whatever we want to call it. Um, I think we're battling our shame, which is why we have this lack of self-worth. It's, it's, it's shame. Um, and anything that we can do um, to get out of that is really important. And you mentioned also that it's important, not just for addicts, but for um, partners and non-addicts. Um, you know, so, so everybody has these feelings of, of low self-worth, pretty much. <laughs> I think it's kind of the human condition, but, but I think when addiction enters our lives, either in our own selves or with people we love, 
it, it's such a challenge and it can be so defeating and there's such a sense of hopelessness and powerlessness over that that we start to lose, pardon me, we start to lose our sense of worthiness and that's it. So yeah, I think it affects partners, it affects kids, it affects the addict. I mean, everybody's affected by this in, in different ways, but it's the sense of, uh, of something's wrong with, with me to have somehow created this. I mean, there's probably no answer to this, but why is this the human condition? I mean, why do we do this to ourselves? Because it seems like everyone does it no matter what. Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, Scott, I, I think part of it these days is social media and the uh, attention and where we're putting our attention and the, the fact that uh, people are on social media particularly are creating, you know, it's no longer a false self that they're walking around with. It's this false, not, it's not false, but it's a, it's a polished version of their life, right? The, the fabulous vacations and the wonderful food and the beautiful people they're with and, and the fabulous cars. And it's, nobody puts the really rough spots on, on their social media. And I think, so we start to compare it. A friend of mine once said, don't compare your inside to other people's outsides, right? We, we know how we feel. And, and I think, so it's, it's like everybody's, the, the whole game escalated. We're all kind of in this competition for um, attention and validation. And that's why I mentioned that zero something, because it's not, it's not that there's a limited quantity to go around, right? It's, it's very much an inside job and there's, there's plenty out there, but we have to seek it in the right places. Yeah, the other thing that I actually see on Facebook when you said everybody puts that polished version of themselves, uh, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they do the exact opposite. They do like, the you know, like my foot just had surgery and it's infected I, and they're putting pictures of their foot like on in the Facebook ADR. and it's That's true. different yeah. colors and it's like, oh my God, that is so nasty. Please don't do yeah. that. Um, but you, And we hear that a lot in 12-step meetings. Oh, my story's way worse. You know, it's, it's like people are trying to one down each other sometimes. And it's just, it's kind of pointless. Um, and it comes from, I think, that lack of self, self-worth. self right. um, You know, addicts are egomaniacs with an inferiority complex. You know, I, I'm a piece of shit, but I'm the world's biggest piece of shit. You know, well, look at me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so um, I want to pull this. I, I know I said I always go to the Q&A first, but I want to deal with this one. It came through the chat feature really quickly first. Um, this is from a sex addict. He just started CSAT counseling. Congratulations. Um, the CSAT told him that he might be subjected at some point to a lie detector test. Is this true? Ah. Okay, well, yes, that, that could be. Um, there, uh, in the process of um, disclosure, which is a formal process that sex addicts go through with their partners uh, with the uh, support and advice of a CSAT therapist, usually one for both the therapist and the uh, addict and the partner. So it's a four, four people dealing on this. It's a very formal disclosure of uh, what the addict has done and there's opportunity for back and forth. And a, a lot of times um, the partners find that the, the safety, the emotional reassurance that they're seeking um, because of a lack of trust, usually a well-deserved lack of trust on the part of the addict, they, they don't really believe or it's not um, adequate to take the word of the addict. And so in such cases, uh, it's not unusual for um, people to use a uh, lie detector test, a um, Scott, what's it, what's it called? The name just went Poly Polygraph. Polygraph. Uh, so you have a polygraph, and it's and it's not a huge long deal. It's there's usually four or five questions, and there are people that are skilled in doing this. Um, but it is it's not unusual, and sometimes, by the way, uh, it can occur. I know in, in uh, cases where there's uh, perhaps been a, ther a therapeutic separation, and they're wondering about coming back together that. There's more than one polygraph that occurs, you know, maybe once every quarter or something for the first year. So it depends on the arrangement between uh, you and your partner and the CSATs. Uh, not everybody does polygraphs. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I have mixed feelings about polygraphs, frankly, but I know some, a lot of people use them and they're not that uncommon. So yeah, it could happen. And you know, just from the addict angle, um, 
why would, if I'm really working my recovery and really working to become honest, and particularly if I'm going to dis give disclosure to my partner about everything that I've done, why would I resist a polygraph? Um, you know, I want my partner to start trusting me again. So if I do my disclosure and tell her or him everything, I'm going to take a polygraph that says, yes, I just told you everything. I would think that might help. So I would want to take the polygraph. And a lot of guys I talk to are happy to take the polygraph. And they're also happy to take a quarterly polygraph for, you know, for the first year, which is something David mentioned, just to help themselves stay accountable. So it's a tool for themselves. It's also a tool to build, rebuild the relationship. Um, I also know of at least one therapist um, who, if he has uh, an addicted client and he thinks that client's not coming clean, which makes it very hard for the therapist to help the client, um, he will ask the client to take a polygraph um, to just to try to get the truth flowing, um, not really to catch them in a lie, but just to sort of open the door to truth. Um, have, have you heard of that, David? I, I, I know at least one person do, has done that. Yeah, I know that does occur sometimes. It's the equivalent of like a little more cumbersome of, of doing a drug test in the office, right? Just, uh, you know, just see if somebody's clean or not or being honest. So yeah, for sure, um, yeah. it does happen. But yeah, if you're in recovery and you're trying to become honest, why would you resist a polygraph? That's, that's my take. Um, but yeah, you know, there are people who are not fans of polygraph, and I know David has mixed feelings about them. Um, so if someone has been a CSAT and admitted, or has seen a CSAT and admit they, admitted they have a problem, um, but maybe not coming right out and admitting they're a sex addict, which happens a lot, um, how can they justify to themselves choosing their addiction over the family they say they love? Um, currently going through divorce and wondering how he could choose, choose divorce over recovery. Um, how can he go back into denial? Great question. Um, sadly, this does happen. Yeah, and I'm sorry for, for that situation that you find yourself in. Um, yeah, I think we see, and this sounds like a case where somebody's kind of half in and half out, right? They usually, uh, if there's some kind of rolling disclosure or, or discovery that um, has been made, uh, a little bit of the facts come out, but not everything, and just sort of sometimes people admit what they have to and don't tell the whole story and that kind of stuff. So I think I, I, I know cases where people do go to see a CSAT or other therapists and kind of admit they have a problem, oftentimes to placate their partner or to kind of make it all go away or keep it quiet. Um, and, and so I think that does happen. Uh, when people are in their addiction, and I would say someone that does that is probably in their addiction, there's, they're really in an altered state in terms of this kind of bubble or trance that we talk about where things that seem um, harmless or uh, that they won't have an impact or that they even sound like kind of a good idea, uh, you know, people's judgment is way off. And I think when they're in that zone, they're going to be very susceptible to following the impulses and the cues and the triggers of their addiction. And that is not going to be a rational decision. And a rational decision, you point out, would be to um, choose recovery over a divorce, but uh, when an addict is in their um, in their midbrain, in that limbic system, right? They're they're really being driven by those impulses and that desire. Uh, they're going to make bad choices, and they're going to make choices like that because they're not really thinking clearly. So, I think um, sadly, it it may take a divorce uh, to uh, get the addict's attention and and. Uh, have them get help with their problem. Uh, it's unfortunate though, but I, this is, I think one of those cases where people are kind of half, half in and half out. They, they can't quite make a full admission that they have a, a problem. Um, but you wonder then what is it gonna take, you know? And uh, hopefully people get there before a divorce comes along, but it may not fall anywhere near short of that. So it may, it may take that. I'm sorry about the situation, but I think in this case, one of the things that I really encourage you to do is really make sure you have support for yourself. Uh, make sure you have support and, and assistance and um, get uh, emotional support so that you don't, um, you're not as susceptible to the uh, kind of haphazard moves of the addict at this point. So you're really making a plan for you. It sounds like you are actually. Yeah, you know, one of the things we sometimes hear in 12-step recovery is one of the characteristics of addiction 
is that it tells you you're not an addict. I mean, that's like one of the, the symptoms of addiction is it tells you you don't have a problem. And, and when I hear that, what it means, what people are saying is denial is a powerful thing. And denial is the lies that I tell myself to make my behavior okay. You know, sure, if David was doing all the stuff I was, I, I've been doing, David would have a real problem. But it's okay for me because, dot, 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 fill in the blanks. And I've got a thousand reasons why it's okay for me. Um, and that, that's what addiction does to us. It, it, when David says we're stuck in that limbic brain and we just give in to the, the urges, it's, be, you know, our denial lets us do that. It's okay for me because. And, and it really overrides the thinking brain and our values and, and we forget what's important. We don't forget, but we just ignore it uh, when the addiction crops up because it's just so powerful. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sorry you're going through that situation too. Um, what are the best tools against euphoric recall in meth and sex addiction, also known as chemsex addiction or sexualized drug use or lots of other things? Right. Great, great question. Um, it's a big, powerful one because anytime we get these intensity addictions like meth or cocaine or porn or sex addiction, uh, there's a really high dopamine release with those drugs or behaviors and it, it imprints very deeply into that, uh, into our brain. So the euphoric recall is uh, likely and very strong. In euphoric recall being that uh, kind of selectively remembering all the good times, if, if there were good times, the exciting times, I should say probably more accurately, the excitement, intensity of it, and kind of selectively forgetting all the bad times, you know, the, uh, the chest pain and the near miss with the law enforcement guys and uh, all that stuff, the paranoia that went on for four days. So we kind of forget that stuff. So it is really important to have some tools to fight against that euphoric recall. I think one of the things, uh, just really thinking it all through and, and not letting yourself fall into that kind of romantic trap of, of the fantasy of meth sex, right? I think that's really, if we can compare the, the fantasy of it versus the reality of it, that's a really powerful tool. Because the reality of it often is, um, you know, days of not eating right or drinking, being really tired, not sleeping, getting psychotic, getting really paranoid, uh, you know, being ripped off in your place, um, having, uh, drug reactions and effects from how you've ingested it. I mean, really unpleasant stuff. Injuries from masturbating for so long. And, and oftentimes, the fabulous hot sex isn't really even occurring. Um, and, and often at the end of somebody's meth career, even going out and hooking up is just way too much trouble. It's so much easier to just stay at home, get high, look at porn, and masturbate. And, and, and feel bad, you know, and feel, feel like a failure and be paranoid and just the whole thing is really unpleasant. And so when people, they, what they're grieving in recovery, and I think what the euphoric recall is about is the fantasy that, And that's all these addictions, these intensity addictions are about anticipation and dopamine is about anticipation. So it's about thinking about, wow, the, you know, the, the erotic uh, sexual desire kind of the, that was in their mind. And, and maybe in the first couple of times they used meth or other drugs, it was that very intense moment, but I think very quickly, the reality of it just doesn't pan out and match the fantasy. So people have to really grieve the fantasy of the meth sex, you know, how hot it could have been, but kind of never really was, and, and just really let that go. And think it all the way through. Don't, don't selectively remember. Think about what it was like for you at the end. You know, what was that paranoia like? Or what was that psychotic stuff like? Or how sick were you? And what was what's happening with your body and, and your mind? And where, what dark places came to life in your mind? You know, think about all the negative stuff that, that happens. And I think that can be really helpful. Yeah, you know, I wish um, particularly chemsex addicts, um, we could like take, you know, time-lapse videos of them over the course of their run and then show that to them when they're sober um, so that they can see, number one, how annoying they are. Um, <laughs> sorry, but... Meth addicts are incredibly annoying, and if they're chasing sex at the same time, they're like creepy annoying, uh, or annoying and creepy and relentlessly. Uh, it's just, um, I think most of, most of the guys who do that would be so embarrassed to see themselves and see what they were doing, and 
Um, and then, you know, and then to keep that tape running all the way through to that next morning, you know, when you haven't been able to sleep in three days and you haven't eaten and you're dehydrated and your head is pounding, and, uh, you know, you're picking at your skin and all that kind of craziness. Um, yeah. yeah, but of course, addiction, we just talked about how powerful denial is. <laughs> you know, it, it'll be different this time because dot, 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 fill in the blank. Um, well, the I'll add one more just to plant the seed there. You know, the, these meth runs often last for four or five days. And, you know, if it's a weekend warrior, you know, they're, they're partying over the weekend. And met, one of the effects of methamphetamine is to totally deplete all the dopamine in the brain. I mean, we have to, when we are deprived of dopamine, we get really, really depressed. And so for a lot of the weekend meth warriors, Tuesday is known as Suicide Tuesday. And that's literally, it's, people are so depressed. So I remember how depressed you were at certain times too because uh, that's really a powerful memory state to remind yourself of yeah, yeah. Um, but euphoric recall can be powerful so powerful um, because it, euphoric recall is euphoric it doesn't remember any of the stuff that we prefer not to remember um, and and with meth and these other powerful addictions euphoric recall can be triggered um, like out of the blue right so uh, you can get a trigger or a craving by just seeing somebody or seeing a picture or hearing a song on the radio or whatever that can remind you of, of your addiction. It can be really, really powerful and, and even more powerful. And it can be physical. I've had guys who um, would, would be triggered and not using the drug, but had a physical reaction as if they just take it. You know, just like it's a really powerful effect. Yeah. Um, does chronic relapsing worsen self-esteem and make us feel worthless? Yes. <laughs> Um, how can I reframe my relapses so they don't damage my self-worth? No. It's a great question. And uh, yeah, you bet. Relapses do a number on, on people. I think um, with the guys I work with who use meth, who, because it, it's really a story of meth recovery that there's chronic relapse in the beginning um, before, and people do get better, but it takes a while sometimes. And there's this, the shame people feel about you know, going up and picking up a, a white chip again, you know, to show their first 24 hours yet again, and just that embarrassment. But it's still, it's an important, I think, an important um, declaration that you're starting again, right? It's, it's important. So, but, but it does lead to that a low, low self-worth and some of that shame that, that people are experiencing. So, you know, reframe the relapses in terms of, to me, um, what, what can we learn from this? You know, that, uh, first of all, uh, you know, I'm not sure what your addiction is, but a lot of the intensity addictions in the beginning, there are, part of it is just our brains are not quite functioning normally. So I think a lot of the relapse with meth, at least, is um, people have a lot of shame, but a lot about it is, is impulse control and the way our brains are, not, are, are that kind of damaged and healing. So not everything is just that because we're failures as, as people, but it's part of it is our brain stuff. But when it does occur, it's really important not to look at it as any kind of failure. It's, it's a really, uh, what happened? That's, that's the only thing that, I, I try not to put a value judgment on it. I really go back to what happened? What can I learn from this? What, what triggered me this time? What skill do I need to strengthen? You know, well, how can I avoid this, doing this again? And how can I take a bad situation and maybe turn it into something slightly positive by learning something that I don't have to make that mistake again? So I would just kind of reframe it in terms of what, what are the lessons here? What can I learn and, and go from there? Um, and I think just uh, one of the huge, probably difficult tasks in recovery is finding some, some self-compassion. And I think sometimes uh, it just, we have to, when, when we can't quite bring ourselves to have self-compassion, we have to really be able to have, surround ourselves with people who do get it. Um, I think one of the unfortunate things in a lot of recovery programs is when people relapse, uh, sometimes, uh, and, and I think those are the times when people need the fellowship most of all. They become kind of pariahs where people don't want to hang out with them because they're, uh, they've relapsed. And I think that's really unfortunate and destructive for people. So my two cents. Yeah, um, you know, I spent my first two years of recovery, uh, you know, on a spinning door in and out, you know, the revolving door. Um, with my multiple addictions, and um, it was tough. Um, but somewhere along the way, it just clicked that my addictions weren't working for me anymore. 
uh, on any level and that recovery, you know, my bouts of sobriety, life was better. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure my self-worth must have been in the toilet at that point. But, um, you know, I started looking at it as a journey. And, you know, somebody told me, you know, recovery is a journey, not a destination. Um, so, you know, stop and start appreciating, you know, the steps forward that you make. Um, and if you backslide a little bit, well, you know, you don't forget what you learned, um, things like that. Um, and, and it really was um, also just backing up to, you know, where is the thought that, that, that occurred that led to my relapse? Um, because that's, that's really where we stop a relapse is with the first thought toward relapse, which is you know, often days or weeks prior to the relapse. Um, yeah. It's, chronic relapse is tough and and you know I see people just keep you know keeping the coming back and, um, and and I'm always proud when I see them again and I always make sure to go up and well not give them a hug these days um, but uh, when we're not in the midst of a pandemic give them a hug I'm so glad you're back welcome you know sit down you know make sure they get some coffee make sure some of my friends go over and do the same thing um, so but yeah it's it's tough so hang in there. Please keep coming back. Um, just found out my wife doesn't want me to stay at her house, which probably isn't a bad idea. She is dictating where I can stay and it feels controlling. At what point does her direction cross the boundary of being controlling? Uh, good question. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so sometimes a, a separation is a good, a good thing and just physically living different places while each person kind of consolidates their their own recovery and, and gets it together. Um, partners certainly have a, a, a voice in what that living arrangement should be in terms of a separate or not, and how often you may see your kids or when you come home or what the terms of kind of engagement, uh, if you guys, uh, how you talk, how often you talk, that kind of thing. Um, I think it does cross a line when, um, it starts being dictated uh, um, where you can stay. Uh, and I, I would kind of investigate that, but I think um, I can see the conditions under which you re-engage. I can see the need for, for example, a safe environment. I've had spouses who wanted their uh, addict partners to be in a sober living environment, which is totally understandable, uh, that kind of thing, where there's some control and, and accountability. Um, but I think it can cross a line. And I think sometimes uh, partners uh, succumb to the need to try to control every detail in an effort to kind of uh, find emotional safety. And I think uh, that really, if that's the goal, that there's no, there's not enough that anyone can do to make them, to reassure them to feel safe. I mean, at some point um, they have to kind of let go of that need to control. So. If I were the therapist here, I would kind of say that this feels a little controlling to me. That's just my opinion, and and that maybe this needs to be talked about. Um, certainly, there's conditions under which uh, the spouse has a has a great interest, but I think to determine the actual place, it sounds a little bit over the line to me. But yeah, I think David hit it on the head. You know, she wants to feel safe, and the thought of you staying with your drinking buddy Fred. Uh, you know, from work, who, you know, likes to go to the strip club, probably doesn't feel safe for her. So if she says, you don't get to stay at Fred, that one I'm on board with. Um, if she says you have to stay at the Holiday Inn instead of the Best Western, I don't know, that's a little weird, you know, unless the Best Western has prostitutes hanging out outside. But, um, I, and, and, but I do want to say, and it, this is the same thing that I kind of said with, um, with uh, the question about polygraphs, is why are you resisting? You know, if you want to save your relationship and you want her, you know, she needs to feel safe. So even if it is controlling, is 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 this the is this the battlefield you want to die on? You know, really. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Good point, Scott. Um, okay, recovering sex addict here, uh, seeking integrity, Los Angeles graduate. Hello. Um, sober for 88 days. Um, my marriage is in a state of disarray, uh, therapeutic separation. It's not going well. 
Um, my life has her own traumas and I have made those raw again. I find myself collapsing under the weight of her anger, contempt, and punitive actions. I'm also triggered by the onslaught of cravings and numbing as they mimic some severe childhood abuse. Um, I fall into shame spirals and withdraw from not only the relationship, but from human contact in its, <coughs> itself. <coughs> and at times, I stop the recovery activities that keep me sober. Um, I numb with binge eating, self-loathing. Uh, when we stop talking, I start to recover. We connect, it goes poorly, and it's back to square one. I know this is my fault. I know I did this. I know I should be accountable, but I find myself emotionally incapable at the moment, no matter how hard I try. How can I cope while stepping up to accept my responsibility? Um, there's a lot there, but a great, great question. Yeah, Gene, I'm sorry you're having a, a difficult time. I'm sorry to hear the, the uh, emotional pain that you're experiencing right now, too. Um, I guess with what you describe, you know, this kind of cravings, numbing, um, some addictive behaviors, you know, binge eating, some of the self-loathing, disconnecting, I mean, all that really uh, big, huge kind of warning flags to me of concern. Um, and so I think really um, my, my opinion is that uh, you really need to focus on you right now, and the, the relationship is really almost secondary because I think you're in great peril. And so I would really um, try to consider that, you know, to, to really focus on the coping thing. And uh, the responsibility is, of course, important, but I think right now it sounds more like a crisis for you as opposed to a healing of the marriage as the primary issue. So, yeah, David, he mentions that, that they're in a therapeutic separation. Does it feel like there might be a little too much contact happening for a therapeutic separation? Is it the point of a therapeutic separation to kind of well, avoid this? Yeah, I hadn't quite gotten there yet, but absolutely, right. To, you're kind of constantly engaging, and I think that uh, the rewounding on all sides is really not beneficial. So I think, um, I assume you have a therapist as well, but I would really talk to your therapist about that, and, and however, whoever kind of helped you with this therapeutic separation, really to talk about that and, and make it maybe more cleaner with more firm boundaries. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I was gonna say is that, I don't know, I think you need to step up the intensity of whatever you're doing. And so if there's a, a men's group or an intensive outpatient program or, you know, whatever, thinking about coming back to us for a week or something, if I, but I think really just from everything you said, I think you're in kind of, real peril right here. And I don't want to see that happen. So I really do everything you can to really focus on your recovery in a crisis mode. And, and I'd really clean up that separation, make a firm wall right now and put that over on the side and really focus on you. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, set those boundaries for this therapeutic separation to avoid some of this triggering of each other. Um, and I, I would encourage you to be a little bit more specific to make sure you tune in um, if you're at all able to the alumni meeting every week yeah. um, for Seeking Integrity Alumni so you can reconnect maybe with some of the guys you were in treatment with who know your story really well. And maybe you guys can start calling each other or, or emailing and checking in. Maybe they can help you because um, there's usually that, that good bond there. Um, yeah. So um, my addict husband and I have been in the disclosure process for about two months now. Um, the, the formal disclosure and the impact letter are completed. The husband is working on his amends letter now. Um, we have not been intimate other than some cuddling, holding hands, etc., for a good six months here. Um, I think I'm at the point where I'm ready to consider being intimate again, but I did not want to go back to the addict type sex we had before. What are some things that will help me know my husband's mind has rebooted? Um, I'd really like to know he has worked on this as well as what healthy intimacy looks like before diving in too deep into these types of conversations. Great question. Yeah, really great question. And, um, you know, congratulations on the recovery work both of you have done. And this is really uh, sounds good. And I really understand where you're coming from in this to kind of want to know kind of where, where people are at. That um, a couple of suggestions. Uh, I do like the fact the cuddling, holding hands. Um, I hopefully communication-wise, you guys are talking and sharing feelings. Um, there, it's really important, as you say, not to go back to uh, old kind of addictive sex. It's, it's important for both of you. And 
uh, one of the struggles that every sex addict has is kind of switching over their arousal template back to kind of more normal sorts of interaction, normal, but not, not the intensity stuff that they are associated with their addiction. That does take time. And so I think one of the, the challenges for sex addicts and chem sex addicts in recovery is reigniting healthy sex and intimacy um, without succumbing to those old kind of tapes and scenarios and fantasies and all that stuff. One of the great ways I think to do that, um, I've mentioned it before, the Masters and Johnson exercise, Sensate Focus, uh, which is uh, an intimacy communication exercise where it's really about pleasuring and receiving and not, it's not sexually explicit in the beginning. It, it, you do it several times. It's a couples exercise that Masters and Johnson created that I think really would be useful for that and just in terms of reconnecting intimacy wise because you um, there's a pleasure and a receiver and the, the person receiving the pleasure and that can be massage or tickling or kissing or caressing or stroking or whatever strikes you. Uh, and the, the partner gives feedback. They, they like that, they don't. Sometimes they guide the hand, but it's a very intimate and uh, very um, antithetical to kind of addictive sex because uh, it's, it's slow, it's connected. And I think that's the other difference to kind of watch for. You're trying to, I think, trying to discern uh, my kind of rule of thumb on that is that addictive kind of sex to me is is feels disconnected because the addict is often in their head. The intention is not so much to connect, but kind of to detach. And they're off in their head. They may be having sex with someone, a body, who may be playing a part in the in the porn tape rolling in their head. You know, it's a, there's an objectification in the addicted way. When it's when you're connected with someone intimately, I think there's a, a intuition. There's some empathy. You kind of understand what's going on with the other person. You. You, there's an energetic connection uh, along with a physical connection as opposed to that kind of disconnect. So I think learning to kind of feel that difference of that distinction is really helpful. But I would try the sensate focus um, and see where that goes. It's a great way to kind of start to feel that. Yeah, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I heard an addict, um, he explained to me that he, as part of his addiction, he had objectified his wife to the point where he was using her the object version of her to cheat on her you know he said i was cheating on my wife with the objectified version of my wife who wasn't really my wife um you know even though it was you know, physically his wife but he wasn't seeing her as a person he was seeing her as an object and, and that it sounds like that's the sex you do not want to have anymore and and good for you um david can you talk a little bit about the healthy dimensions of sexuality the, the seven healthy dimensions um, I mean, it goes hand in hand with Masters and Johnson. But. Right. So um, I can't probably name them all off the top of my head, but um, so <laughs> basically the gist, for you. The, the gist of it is, is just, it's that idea of connection. It's, it's a emotional intimacy, you know, the emotional connection, it's, it's the physical connection, it's the connection, it's pleasing and satisfying sexually and also not sexually, right? It, it doesn't always have to be sex focused or orgasm focused. So it, it really just the idea is to broaden the dimensions of it in a way that uh, I think most addicts are very focused on certain things or certain acts. And it's really, it's kind of broadens the whole experience. So it doesn't have to, um, it can include, I think, so, you know, sex and intimacy can include holding hands and, and cuddling and all that. You know, it doesn't have to be you know, orgasmic uh, driven all the time. So I think just expanding that, but it's, it's all about um, affirming and it may, it, healthy sex can, should make you feel better as opposed to uh, worse or disconnected or exploited or it's about reaffirming worth. You know, we're talking tonight about worthiness. It, it should be affirming in a way that, that values both people and, and reaffirms their, their value and worth as individuals. So yeah, there's a lot of dimensions, but it's all about, I think, connecting and, and reinforcing safety and healthy connections as opposed to um, kind of a head trip. And the, the dimensions start like way, before, way, way, way before sex with, you know, just getting in touch with your own body and your five senses, you know, what smells do you like? What, what sounds do you like? You know, what tastes good? What, you know, what just being touched, what feels good? And then it goes on to like, you know, can you have fun with your friends and family? Not necessarily your partner, just have fun. You know, can you sit down and play Parcheesi with your kids? And 
and enjoy it. Um, kind of have to work up through these steps before you then you work on this enjoying time with your your partner and then you work on you know as david said you know non-sexual touch and then you maybe go to sex and then there's a a spiritual element too and um, can you elaborate a little bit on the the spiritual nature of, of, of partner sex david yeah i think there's um it's hard to describe, but I think sometimes people are really connected. And this remember, if we're focusing on the kind of healthy connection, there there is a um, a kind of uh, extraordinary dimension that can happen with um, intuition, with the feeling of connection. With a, it's almost like a in itself like a mood altering state. I think when people are really on the same vibration, right? And and uh, I think that can have kind of a spiritual element to it. Um, in terms of um, meaning and purpose, and it, it kind of has a, a, a special feeling all its own. And I think that that can definitely happen when there's that connection there. That often takes some time, right? It's not that it's, we're not talking about the the hot sex of an early relationship, but more the established intimacy and really knowing the other person at many different levels and in many different phases of their emotional expression. I think it's yeah, it adds it's just a depth that I think comes with time and familiarity and trust. Thank, thank you. I, I, I've always found that one sort of a really interesting dimension to sexuality because I've never thought of it that way. But, but when it's explained, it's like, okay, I get it, you know, and, and, and I want it, you know, I want that. Um, so, um, okay, uh, I am a Map and sex addict. Um, I feel quite uncomfortable sharing in 12 steps meeting, 12 step meetings where I do not know many people. Um, I tried it before and I felt worse after sharing them before. However, I feel very comfortable sharing one on one with people who know me. Um, can multiple one on one connections and sharing replace the suggestion to share in 12 step meetings? Hmm. Well, I think one of the great healing forces of um, recovery meetings is the group, the group setting. And um, it's certainly important to have one-on-one -on -one contact as well. And one-on-one -on -one contact is valuable. It, it adds a lot. But I think, um, I don't think a series of sequential one-on-one -on -one meetings is the same as participating in a group. Uh, there's a special healing force that happens in a group. And so I think I would really encourage you to um, go through your discomfort, try to work through your discomfort and share just a little bit. If only to say, hi, my name is X and I'm, I just want to say hello and, you know, acknowledge my presence at this meeting. It could be as simple as that, but you want to make kind of an energetic connection with the people in the room. I think it, it's really important. And I think I, I was the same way. I, I couldn't, I didn't share my first 90 days. Um, I, my heart was pound. I tried to share a couple of times and couldn't bring myself to. And I, then I, for the, probably the next 90 days, I was, I would rehearse what I was going to say, and I was so I didn't hear anything anybody else said because I was like trying to get my words straight, and and eventually I got comfortable enough where I could share spontaneously, and I think that's when the real truth comes out, and that's when the the good things come out, where people say, "Wow, that was really like profound." It's like, "What did I say?" I don't remember, but uh, yeah, when you're spontaneous, and I think I would just work on that because right now this sounds like a block, and I think if you're having that discomfort in that setting, you're probably having it in other settings in your life. And I think it would be, you're gonna find yourself too constricted in your recovery. I'd really encourage you to fight through that. And again, start small, don't start. And, and you, the thing that helped me, going to small meetings. I know some of the, uh, I don't know if you're talking about CMA, um, some of those meetings, things where I live are huge and they're very, um, it, it's really kind of tricky because uh, there's a lot of people there and, you know, people that are very conscious about how they look. And, and so it's a kind of very threatening environment sometimes. So I, I'd find a small, comfortable meeting and, and, uh, and make yourself at home at that meeting for a while and, and get comfortable. Yeah. Um, as far as the power of a group setting, there is nothing more validating to me as a person than to share at a 12 step meeting and see heads nodding around the room because people are like identifying with what I'm saying. 
Um, and it lets me know that, yeah, I'm crazy, but I'm not the only one who's crazy in this way. We've all been crazy this way once in a while. Um, but like David, in the beginning, um, I was willing to share in the beginning. And it, it didn't freak me out and it didn't get scared, but I wasn't really willing to tell the truth. Um, I was far more interested in saving my face than saving my ass, to use 12-step lingo. You know, you can't do both. You can't save your face and your ass at the same time. And people kept telling me that because they knew I was full of crap when I was sharing, oh, everything's great. Um, and I, I had to get past that. And what helped me get past that um, was A, smaller meetings, which David mentioned, and B, um, I sought out what we call fellowship meetings, which are meetings where people go out for coffee or dinner or lunch or, or, or just hang out in the parking lot for 45 minutes after the meeting and talk and get to know each other. Um, you know, I'm the same way at a party. If I walk into a party and I know everyone in the room, I am totally comfortable. I have a great time. It doesn't matter if there's five people or 500. But if I walk into a room and there's 10 people there and I only know one of them, I am a mess. I'm really uncomfortable. I'm filled with anxiety. And I'm the same way, uh, or I was the same way, certainly for the first several years of 12-step recovery, walking into a room, if I knew a bunch of people, I was good. Um, and I could share and I could listen and participate. Um, you know, and, and if I needed more than that, I could say, hey, I want to go to dinner afterward. Who needs fellowship? And, you know, somebody always came over and was like, yeah, let's go. Um, and I got to know people. Once I knew people, it was easier. So I encourage you to keep going to the meetings. And even if all you say is, hi, my name is Scott. I'm an addict. I'm really uncomfortable sharing. I just want to introduce myself and be known so I can be part of the group. That is all you have to say. And people will reach out to you. Um, they will. Um, because we've all been there. <laughs> people get it. We've all been there. David's been there. I've been there. You're there now. But keep going. Um, and, you know, I hated meetings for a, a year. I hated them. Now I love them. You know. So, um, this next bit is, is a follow-up from the question about um, where can the addict stay and not stay. Uh, and he says, she says I can't stay at my mom's. Thoughts? <laughs> uh, that, on, on its face, sounds like a little bit of an overstepping of boundaries, but I I guess question why that is, if she has a reason for that. And I still yeah, think- I could, I could certainly make up a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, your mom hates me. <laughs> I don't want you going and staying with someone who hates me and is gonna be in your ear about, you know, why are you putting up with this? You know, I, I would say this is a really great opportunity to kind of practice negotiating and listening and listening to other people's needs and wants and, and, your, and being heard yourself, asking for what you need and see if you can come to some kind of reasoned um, approach to this. Yeah, and is, is there a way to approach the wife and say, you know, I'd really like to stay at my mom's. I understand you don't want me to. Can you explain your qualm or what it is that causes you to feel unsafe if I go to my mother's house as opposed to somewhere else? I mean. Is there a way to bring that up in a, in a healthy way where it's not going to trigger the betrayed partner, who's probably pretty pretty triggered right now to begin with? Right. I think that's that's absolutely the, the goal here because these situations are going to come up. This is a really nice opportunity to kind of practice new behaviors and not trigger each other. And and sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. But um, the other thing too, I think, because couples usually by the time they find their way to to us are well-versed in reacting and not really listening and just kind of jumping and playing their, their, their tapes over and over again when they argue with each other. And so a third party might be really helpful in this situation, a therapist or uh, somebody who can kind of act as referee or guide or um, outside objective observer or something like that. Yeah, and you know, betrayed partners um, will ask for things that sometimes feel unreasonable because they are traumatized and a traumatized person is in crisis and people in crisis are not sane. you know if you have a 10 year old son who gets hit by a car and you rush to the hospital you may scream at the poor doctor who's trying to save your son because you're traumatized by what happened to your son and you're in crisis and you know 
doctors, they see that I mean, doctors get yelled at all the time for really bizarre reasons. Um, but they understand the people they're working with are in crisis and, and, you know, they'll cut you some slack. But when you're in a relationship, she's in crisis, you're in crisis, the relationship's in crisis. It's hard to cut each other any slack. So, yeah, reach out um, for third-party help if you can. Um, so, And, I, you know, I always think um, if, as the addict, um, you know, I caused it. I'm going to have to give a little more than she's willing to give. Um, you know, even if it seems unreasonable, sometimes it might be worth it to just say, okay, I'll do what you've asked me to do instead of what makes sense to me. Um, but that's hard to do, <laughs> you know, particularly if you're a guy, uh, you know, uh, we're just not wired that way sometimes. Um, so. Any, any thoughts to take us out, David? Um, yeah, just just that remembering those worthiness skills that we have inherent value and we need to embrace challenges. This uh, that last one we've been discussing would be a challenge like this to to embrace. Um, know the power of the word yet, and uh, believing that we're enough and we all are. Just today, but yeah. Thanks. Lovely thought to take with us. So uh, thank you, everybody. Um, David will be back next week. I will be gone next week, but Tammy Verhelst will be here with them. And then David and I together will be back in two weeks. We will see you then. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night, Scott. Good night.